Hello, I'm Tyler Bamford, the Leventhal Research Fellow here at the National World War II Museum, and joining me today to talk about the liberation of the Berga concentration camp is Kim Geis, Assistant Director of Curatorial Services. Kim, can you tell me a, a little bit about the Berga concentration camp? Sure, Berga was one of the many subcamps of Buchenwald. So Buchenwald had around 88 subcamps. So Berga was one of the subcamps. It was established very late in the war. The first prisoners arrived from Buchenwald, they were transferred from there, in November of 1944. So the camp was small and it was only in existence for a short while. Um, it was intended to be a um, plant for synthetic oil and it was um, intended to be underground. So the primary function of those held at Berga was to tunnel, to make these mines um, to build the underground plant. So in late 1943, due to the Allied bombing campaign, a lot of manufacturing in Germany has to go underground. And so this was one of the camps where the workers were, were helping to make that transition to try and keep the German war machine going? Exactly. Okay. So in in uh, mid-April 1945, April about April 20th, 1945, the 90th and the 11th divisions are the 90th Infantry Division and the 11th Armored Division are approaching the Berga concentration camp. Now the SS has already started to evacuate some of these soldiers, um, but could you tell us a little bit about the experiences of these divisions uh, prior to their, the invasion of Germany? Sure. I think, you know, this this particular period was interesting in that it sort of was a race to the finish line for a lot of units. Um, the German defenses were down. Um, there was a lot of resistance, of course, but from, from isolated outfits um, and from resistors. Mm -hmm. um, and so this was, I think, a, you know, there was, it was described as an aggressive location um, of, of resistors and cleaning up of, of the area. Mm -hmm. So I think, um, you know, people were tired. Um, people had been in combat, some for a long time. The 90th Infantry Division had been, um, they were in combat for 357 days, wow. uh, 35 days, 335 days. Mm -hmm. And out of those 335 days, 267 days were spent in contact with enemy forces. So, you know, that's, that's a long time. <laughs> and um, so I think, you know, there was some idea that this was wrapping up. Um, so the, the, the inmates of the Berga concentration camp, they faced their own unique horrors that were, that were uh, different at every single camp. Uh, could you talk a little bit about what made this camp a little bit different than some of the others? So Berga was different um, in one particular aspect that relates to the American GI, and that is um, Berga held 350 American prisoners of war. Mm -hmm. And it's really special circumstance. Um, you know, this went against all of the rules of mm -hmm. the G Geneva Convention. Um, they were prisoners that were captured during the Battle of the Bulge. Oh, wow. So many of them had just arrived. You know, they were, were new and, and newly arrived in Europe and captured during the Bulge. And they were taken to um, Stalag 9B. And at Stalag 9B, they were asked to self-identify, really, mm -hmm. whether um, they were Catholic, Protestant, or Jewish. Mm -hmm. And Jewish soldiers faced, you know, a, a particular, I think, horror in, um, in the thought of being captured by the Germans because mm -hmm. they knew, um, you know, of uh, the persecution of Jews in Europe. And so, but many people, many Jewish American soldiers did um, have H and H on their dog tags, which signified that they were Jewish. Mm -hmm. And um, and at Berga in February 1945, 350 American prisoners of war were selected for transfer to the Berga concentration camp. 
And that selection was really, really interesting. A lot of American soldiers, you know, there were 4,000 POWs, Americans, in Stalag 9B. Mm-hmm. And many um, POWs said, you know, no, we'll, we, we won't stand for this. Don't, we're not going to, to let you take anyone. Um, and some, some said, sure, go ahead. Mm-hmm. <laughs> or, you know, it was harder for some to resist. Um, and so these were well-fed American troops in December and January when they're, captu- when they're captured in the Battle of the Bulge, but by April they had been through a lot as, as POWs. They'd been emaciated. Uh, so when American soldiers you know, encounter, the, uh, the liberators encounter them, uh, what, what are the reactions? I think it was a shock to see um, for American troops, for the liberators, to see these walking skeletons in American uniforms. Mm-hmm. Um, they are also GIs, and um, you know, to see someone in a similar, um, from a similar outfit, mm-hmm. um, who had ended up in as a slave laborer in a concentration camp was was a shock. But here, you know, when when you see the Germans capturing American uh, soldiers and treating them this way, it really shows that this was not at all the the clean and civilized war that it's sometimes portrayed, that the the Germans were doing some really horrible things against all all rules of warfare in in this area. Yes, and your fate really depended on, um, your fate as an American prisoner of war in particular, you know, depended on who was on the other side of the barbed wire, who... Mm -hmm you know, who captured you, Mm -hmm. where you ended up. So um, these 350 individuals, American prisoners of war, were selected because they either were Jewish, Mm -hmm. um, as they had identified, Um, they had Jewish sounding surnames, Mm -hmm. they looked different. So one particular individual, Anthony Acevedo, he was Mexican American um, and he just looked different. Um, he looked Jewish to the Germans, and so he was selected for a transfer to Berga. And this must have been especially hard because the divisions that liberated these POWs were also comprised of every segment of American society, so many of them might have seen themselves in these soldiers, more so even than the other concentration camps. I think that's right. Yeah. And they, you know, when they liberated um, these columns of individuals on the forced marches, um, they began throwing them every kind of food imaginable. Um, someone described an Italian American tanker from the um, from the Bronx, I think, um, handing him a pepperoni, and he said, "I'd never, I'd never had pepperoni before," you know. Mm-hmm. So you know, just just. They anything they they could give them they did. You can really imagine the vivid you know scene of liberation and, and the, the 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 triumph and the the emotional toll and the, and the flood of emotions that must have uh, overcome all on both sides. Really. Yeah, one yeah. individual said that his um, his father would send him a birthday card every day on April twentieth because that was when he was reborn. Wow. So powerful. So when these units came across the survivors of the Berga concentration camp, what kind of scene greeted them? So they saw lots of different things, but walking skeletons, essentially. Um, people who could, who were barely people any longer. Um, one um, prisoner said that he was in the twilight zone before death. Wow. and. Had anything in these divisions' experiences prepared them for this in their in their combat, you know, accolades that before this? Um, both of those outfits had seen quite a bit of death and destruction. They had been in combat for a long time, um, especially the 90th um, Infantry Division. They landed on D-Day and on Utah Beach, and and really were active throughout. Um, the 11th Armored Division was very active in the Bulge Instrumental, and so they had, um, you know, seen a lot of death and destruction. And just given uh, given their um, their nicknames, you know, mm-hmm. the Tough Hombres, uh, the 90th, and and the Thunderbolt um, of the 11th Armored, you know, they were not um, they were. Uh, 
they were tough. Wow. <laughs> But so this this experience was was really jarring as it was for for many of the other thirty six divisions that uh, liberated concentration camps across Germany and so I, I think you brought a quote with you today that that really um, captures the the trauma of this experience and what it meant to these soldiers when they liberated these camps. Could you share that with us? Sure. Um, this is a passage from the unit history of the three hundred and fifty seventh Infantry Regiment, and they write. The sight of these liberated prisoners of war and slave laborers from other nations wrung pity and pride from the hearts of all and brought to everyone's mind the real reason why America was fighting this war. The deplorable condition of those unfortunate people brought stark realization of the true value of democracy and its worth to freedom-loving people. It's definitely poignant words that we should keep in mind as we celebrate the, both the anniversary of the end of the war, but also the liberation of millions of people who had, had endured so much under Nazi Germany's rule.